of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tina Oberly with the St. Genevieve NEA, and i uh, like to report that this morning uh, we had our breakfast, and it was enjoyed by many. Uh, we had several of our board members that was able to attend. We also had the three that are candidates for our board, and so we also had our president of the Missouri NEA, Chris Gunther, was present to help us flip pancakes, which he was busy doing other things. Plus, she was here to present the award, or the Ca California Casualty uh, Literacy Grant to the one I mentioned last month. It was Brie Uzel, who teaches the French. Um, she got a nice little sum, and what she's going to do is to buy <coughs> magazine subscriptions so that in French to teach her uh, class on the different reading levels that they need. So it was quite interesting to see what she wrote up. And, uh, we also had our ESPs that were present. We had a nice little crowd. Uh, and also, uh, I got started here passing out the invitations to uh, the, leader, the legislative dinner. So I'm coming around after the meeting, I'll finish. And then also a little note for uh, the Governess One, which we are uh, with the NEA to meet with um, Capital Action Days, which is February 20th, and the Legislative Dinner, which is on the 21st, the following day. And I was reading that Roman, I believe that's how you say his name, from Farmington, he is actually on the Education Committee. He's the chairperson, so he is supposed to be there, that legislative uh, reception. So hopefully we get an opportunity to talk with him and kind of get his ideas of where he thinks education is going and share with him what we feel is important also. Thank you. My name is Jamie Bowman. Um, I'm not a very eloquent speaker, but I will try to get my point across. Um, I'm here to represent all of the art department here at St. Genevieve R2 School District um, because I feel like we need to be proactive on a proposal that will be brought up later tonight um, down in New Business for Gifted Education Program Revision. Last week I learned um, that through Mrs. Cooper's retiring that um, gifted students would be um, shared by one teacher, uh, Mrs. Cook, through both elementary schools, the middle school and the high school. And with that, I began wondering what would happen with the art department. Um, Mrs. Cooper teaches two fundamentals of art classes and one advanced art class, which is 50 plus students. And Mr. Otto also teaches a high school art class. There's no way that I can absorb all those kids without another art teacher. And inadvertently today, I found out that this was being discussed that maybe no one would be hired in Mrs. Cooper's place. There's also um, 
times whenever Mr. Cook and Mrs. Guilford are stretched on time, Mr. Cook does not have all of his planning time that he should be allotted. He has 25 classes during the day. Mrs. Guilford has two classes four times a week. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Over 30 kids so that she can travel from Bloomsdale to here and be able to get cover all the kids that we need to for our elementary art classes. And I feel like what they're doing is killing her, well, what's being proposed is killing the gifted program. Eventually, with the hours that are going to be offered, fewer and fewer kids through the last six years that I've been here, fewer and fewer are able to take it. We finally got the art program. They were excited to say, build up the art program. It's going to go down the tubes because there's not going to be enough offerings. We're going to have three fundamental of art classes and three advanced classes, and depending on which hour they're offered, because of advanced chemistry or math or whatever, those higher achieving kids aren't going to be able to get into those classes. I have a student that took art as a freshman, has not taken art again until this year. She is choosing to be an art teacher, has not taken art until this year because she has been unable to get it in her schedule. And that's only going to happen more and more. I mean, we. I, I, feel, I do, I feel like it's really letting down the gifted program, but we have to have another art teacher, even if it's a K to 12 person to fill in all those <coughs> different areas. So I'm just imploring everybody to think about this because everybody's stretched the way it is. The kids, I mean, I have a girl that's so talented that she would never be in art because of her commitments to band or her, or her academics because she's good at everything. Where are these kids supposed to get that? I mean, and you build these special relationships and you're not going to allow those kids to do what they enjoy doing. I mean, if you feel passionate about teaching, you would think that you would be proactive so that they can keep what, they, what they're choosing to do. And I mean, that's what we want them to be able to do is have those choices. So, um, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know. I just, Mr. Otto has a high school class. There's 24 in there now. I mean, and art is considered a lab class, just like a science class. I give them knives, and I am in there with 24 kids, and they all have knives, and I don't. And, you know, it's a lab class. You're supposed to have 20. He has 24, I have 24, 26. I mean, we, have, we all are over that 20 lab number. So to reduce, again, even half a teacher is hurting us when I think we could use a full one the way it is. So whenever I found out today, I mean, this is all kind of off the cuff, because when I found out today that this might happen, I just felt like I needed to be here. I mean, what else are we going to do? I mean, I don't know. Am I leaving anything out? I'd like to speak about, uh, I'd like to thank the board for the uh, time that I have been here with the school district. I've taught in this district for over 25 years. Uh, 23 of it with gifted education and many times I have gone to board members and spoken with them about my concerns and uh, I just want to thank you for your support all these years. I feel as a teacher that I owe, even though I am retiring, that I owe an allegiance to my students to make sure that they continue to receive the best education that they can and I would like for the board to look very carefully at the proposal that is being uh, going to be proposed for the program change of the gifted because I feel like it is not in the best interest of the students. I feel like there should be other options explored 
I don't think any one person in our district should be asked to teach students third through 12th grade because we have no one in our district that does that. We might have uh, special services which offer services, but they do not write and prepare and deliver curriculum from grades three through 12. And we're looking at advanced students that need that um, curriculum. They need that challenge. And I think it is improbable. I'm not saying that Mrs. Cook is not qualified. I just don't think any one person can do that. And I have concerns. Several teachers express concerns. Some administrators express concerns and uh, students. So please look very carefully at this. Thank you. is set for April the 2nd, 2013. We do have, uh, at this time, four candidates. We have Terry McDaniel as an incumbent. We have uh, Mr. Larry Falk. Larry, I believe you're here tonight. You want to stand up and let folks know who you are. <laughs> uh, we have Mr. Rick Rudloff. Mr. Rudloff's with us this evening. And Mr. John Boyd. And uh, he's back there in the back. So, uh, Thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll enjoy having you join us uh, as often as you choose to between uh, now and the election. Um, it is Missouri School Board Member Recognition Week, and so I want to take this opportunity to say thank you to uh, you one and all, and uh, take a moment to read uh, the proclamation from uh, our governor related to this um, week. It says, whereas a system of quality public education is essential to the future of our state and nation, and whereas the people of Missouri have a long tradition of support for public education and their local school districts, and whereas local school boards are the ultimate expression of the unique American institution of representative governance of public school districts, and whereas local school boards, acting on behalf of and in close connection with the people of their communities, chart the direction of education in their communities, and whereas local school boards serve as the key community advocate for children, youth, and the public schools. Now, therefore, I, Jeremiah W.J. Nixon, Governor of the State of Missouri, do hereby proclaim January 20th through the 26th, 2013, to be School Board Recognition Week in Missouri, and urge all Missourians to recognize school boards as they strive with their communities to improve our public schools through quality leadership. And so. We, we do have the proclamation, and I included a copy of that um, in, your, in your packets. But I also have uh, certificates for each one of you. And I uh, want to add my personal thanks for all that you do and all, that, uh, all the time you give. Um, you know, this is totally without pay. In fact, it probably costs them more to be a, a board member <laughs> than uh, any recompense that they get. Uh, we do provide sodas, so I, I think that's pretty good. Uh, but no, seriously, I, I appreciate each and every one of you and the uh, just the way that you do your business and the, the way that you represent uh, your kids in this community. So thank you very much. We have Miss Martha Reesinger. Martha has been on the board now, I believe, 23 years. Congratulations, and Miss Joan Dunsey. Uh, Joan is this. Uh, I have a cheat sheet over here. Uh, I've got 10 years, is that right? All right. And uh, Mr. Mack, 12 years. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Kirshner, 19 years, is that correct? Mr. Crowther, you are one of the new kids on the block. Um, two years on the board, along with Mr. Bosler, two years on the board. And Mr. Bova, you're the, the kiddo here, uh, one year on the board. Thank you all for your service. I do appreciate your time and efforts. It's a rewarding position. Even though we have some, it's a rewarding position. 
it's always uh, a challenge when, when we're trying to chart the course between a variety of uh, demands. Uh, you're pulled in lots of good ways. I mean, there's, there's lots of good things we can do, and we have to balance uh, all of those things as we look at it together. Um, we have kindergarten registration coming up. Who, can you believe we're already talking about that? But it is that time of the year, and so I want to encourage parents and community members and anybody that has a child that uh, is going to be five pretty soon, even younger children can come for the screening. Uh, we're, we're glad to know about all the young people in the district, and so our dates for that would be at St. Jen Elementary, March the 23rd, uh, from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., and at Bloomsdale, April the 6th, from 8 to 1. Those are both Saturday mornings. Um, get, you know, call early, get your prime appointment time, and uh, bring your, your kids in and pass the word around to those you know who have children of that age. Uh, we did have teacher in service today. Uh, Dr. Lindsay, you care to say anything <coughs> more about that? I'm oh, sorry, Terry. On the kindergarten registration, folks, that's the hardest grade of any to predict enrollment. So if you know anybody out there that has a student, a child that's not of kindergarten age, because all the other grades you have a grade before. So at many times when I was a principal, I had parents come to me and says, when did you know how many kindergartners you're going to have since the first day of school? Absolutely. You just have ballpark estimates. Yeah. And sometimes you just got more and you just say, keep coming. And I had one uh, family that lived a half mile from the school. They registered the first day of school. So anything you can do to pass the word, people. That's right. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to put a plug in. I know I say this every year, and y'all are probably tired of hearing it, but um, whenever Jacob, my older son, was um, three, we brought him in for the pre-kindergarten testing, and actually that's where we discovered that he had a hearing loss, that we were able to get him fitted with hearing aids at the age of three, and really the hearing, his hearing impairment didn't affect him throughout his schooling, and right now he's studying to be a teacher, so I think that school is a pleasant experience for him, but anyway, I would just encourage you if you're in the community, even if you don't suspect anything, because we didn't, um, it's, it's a good thing to bring them in to be screened. Yeah, that, absolutely true. And, uh, this year was one of those prime examples where we wound up having to add a class uh, very late because we continued to have kindergartners come in. And I'll never forget the conversation I had with a father. It wasn't this year. It was actually the last time we had to do this. was two or three years ago out of Bloomsdale. And he said, don't you people know how many kids you're going to have? And, and he said, we, we bring them to the screenings. And, he's, and I said, sir... Surprisingly enough, not everyone brings their child to those screenings. They just, some of them show up the first day of school, and he was amazed. So uh, please get the word out as, as best you can. It is important to us. Um, anything you would like to say about the in service today, Dr. Lindsay? It seemed to go pretty well. I think it uh, started with a, uh, an overall uh, group presentation in, in the Performing Arts Center. several breakout sessions. I do uh, uh, appreciate the, the work that the PD committee uh, put in to, uh, uh, to make things run smoothly and, and also to our, our local people that uh, uh, did some of the breakout sessions. Uh, we had some of our own staff that did those and, and then of course also to, uh, uh, to Dennis Lewis and Judy Greener that uh, were a part of the, uh, the large group presentation and then also did uh, breakout presentations. Uh, but uh, uh, the feedback that Um, the last item here is safety issues, and we'll be talking more about specific safety issues in a, in a minute, but uh, this is an item that is a, a standard uh, agenda item that our school insurance uh, consortium music uh, asks that every week, uh, every month we have uh, safety as an item. Uh, I've included here because this past month we had fire drills, and uh, it's actually fire earthquake drills. We fondly call them shake and bake. I know that's terrible, but, you know, in the vernacular. Um, you. It was a uh, first of all drop and cover drill and then an evacuation drill. And so I, I uh, gave you some copies there of uh, some of the things that we, because we do those and to us they're routine. We, we're, we are used to being conscious and aware of safety. We drill, we evaluate. This goes on every time we have a drill. And so I thought I would uh, start including these so that you could kind of get a sense of the, 
just the fact of what we do. So anyway, no no safety issues to report. Our drill went well, and, and uh, the other issues that we had, we'll talk about later. Thank you. Have any comments, questions? Okay, we'll move on to unfinished business, which would be school safety review. Yes, Dr. Lee. Uh, basically, what what I want to do is briefly talk about the process. also a process that, that we've gone through annually, maybe not to this extent, but we do review our safety plans on an annual basis and, and update them and, and uh, do a variety of things. But uh, um, we felt like since student safety is, is our first priority um, and, and the safety of our faculty and staff that's here, that, that we might want to do an extensive overall review and really look at <coughs> So we started the process, um, uh, contacted uh, Mr. Lewis and, and Mrs. Pruner, uh, had worked with them before. Uh, they're co-founders of an organization called EduSafe, and they're really experts uh, in the area of school safety and security. And so that kind of started the process. Uh, we also, um, we had some building level committees uh, where each building uh, put, put together a committee that had teachers, administrators, had parents, that reviewed things specific to their to their building, looked at access points, looked at uh, uh, concer concerns, basically, that they had for, uh, uh, for their building, and also came up with a list of, of some uh, potential recommendations uh, of ways to address those concerns. So uh, those committee meetings uh, occurred. That information uh, we reviewed and passed on to uh, uh, Mr. Lewis and, and Mrs. Pruner as well. Then we brought together the district level uh, safety committee that is, is made up of uh, representatives from the district, uh, including uh, a couple board members uh, that, that serve on, on that committee. So uh, Martha and, and Eric uh, appreciate uh, you, you being there and, and uh, participating in that, as long as rep along with representatives from the sheriff's department, uh, police department, fire department, uh, so on and so forth. And, and we looked at, at the information that came out of the building level reviews. Um, Mr. Lewis uh, was present at that meeting as well and, and presented some really good information. And uh, kind of as a part of the process, we're going to take a look at the recommendations. <clears throat> when Mr. Lewis finishes, finishes his report uh, and provides us with a written copy of some things that we can look at, then we can take all that information and attach some, some uh, cost uh, with each of those because we Obviously, we want to do something that's going to be effective, but also something that's going to be feasible and practical and affordable. Uh, so in order to do that, you need to know what each of those items, uh, what the costs are associated with each of those items. Uh, so uh, once we get that information, we're going to go back to the district level safety committee and have them do some prioritization. And then we'll bring it back to you uh, for you to uh, take a look at those things hopefully make some informed decisions at that point about what are some things that that, uh, uh, that are effective that can be done and here's, here's the associated cost with it. Uh, as a part of the process, we had uh, Mr. Lewis and, and Mrs. Bruner come in and they did a complete evaluation of our facility, uh, took a look at our uh, procedures and policies with respect uh, to that, uh, looked at facilities both from an external uh, viewpoint and internal teachers, so on and so forth, uh, to really get a good picture of where we stand. Uh, and at this point, I'd like uh, Mr. Lewis to, to kind of present some of that information to you, describe in more detail what the process, uh, what his process is that, that he goes through. And um, so at this time, I'll turn it over to Chairman Dennis Lewis. Chair, did you work in the, uh, at least that middle side of lots?
providers, parents, I mean, everyone was coming together uh, and kind of have a discussion on this topic. And so what we wanted to do tonight was, uh, in response to the work we've done over the last week, is to provide you just kind of uh, have an overview. Um, <coughs> we talked in preliminary terms of some of the things that we have uh, seen, uh, the things we want to make you aware of. So with that in mind, uh, you know, we'll kind of work through a fairly short PowerPoint tonight. operate from what I call our pillars of uh, the foundation, the pillars of school safety. And so I kind of wanted to put this in front of you tonight to give you a feel for, for where we come from as we look through buildings, do interviews, look at procedures and practices, kind of the things that kind of guide us uh, in our work. Um, you know, staff and faculty recognizing the importance of school climate and connecting with kids is, is really foremost uh, in one of the things that we look for. In fact, if you were to uh, ask myself or Judy, um, you know, what the number one safe school strategy is out there, uh, you might be surprised, and you might not be surprised that uh, from our perspective, it's not going to be cameras and locking systems and visitor check-in procedures. It will always be, always has been, and continue to be the connecting with kids piece. Um, and so, you know, we had an opportunity to visit with staff, and so it was, you know, some of what we looked for, uh, you know, was that. In fact, I, I will tell you specifically uh, out at Bloomsdale, uh, there was a third grade teacher that we uh, did an interview with, and one of the things that she had, uh, that she communicated to us, uh, was that she had had a discussion in her classroom with her kids, uh, went along the lines of her expectations for her children, should something go awry in the classroom, and she not be available to provide them direction or guidance, and I, again, just thought that was, was admirable, and also, again, illustrated, you know, here's a teacher representative of the entire school district making a, a, a true effort to connect with kids, and, uh, uh, you know, really and try to ensure their safety. Uh, the second pillar up there deals with the proactive and, and staying current on issues and trends. Um, you know, I will just tell you it's pretty clear to us right up front that the district is being very proactive uh, on this topic. Um, you know, I, to some degree, you guys are ahead of the curve. Uh, you know, while we saw some facility issues out there that I'm going to discuss with you in a few minutes, um, philosophically and um, uh, you know, where you're putting your energy at right now is being proactive on this topic. So I want to see that really across the district uh, with administrators, teachers, uh, maintenance people, and, and so forth. And then lastly, uh, the cooperation, uh, the uh, cooperative atmosphere between the various school community agencies. Um, sometimes we see uh, the committee process on school safety in schools being run entirely by school people. And uh, while clearly, from the, clearly in the educational realm, uh, there's a perspective out there uh, what we really like to see is a real broad-based perspective. And, you know, in attending the committee meeting, one thing that really impressed me real quickly was, was the, the comp composition of the committee. Uh, it's real broad-based across the community, uh, community. It included, you know, members of the school board as well as law enforcement and people from the uh, EMS services and firefighters and, and so forth. And so, we, again, we think that's really um, a real plus. And also, uh, with the safety committee, uh, I mean, I just received a phone call this afternoon from a district that um, we may be engaging in some work with in the future. And one of the questions I asked was revolved around their safety committee process. And the comment was, well, they're in the process of getting one together. I, I find it notable and a real plus that you have a standing committee in place that you can draw upon really at a moment's notice. And I think uh, that's a best practice as we do it. So, uh, Dr. Lindsay talked a little bit about the process from the district's perspective. Uh, I want to walk you through real quickly the process that we are actually using uh, just uh, you know, with our firm and how we're looking at things. Uh, we've uh, met with the administrative teams from uh, each of the schools, um, typically the principal, assistant principal. Um, we not only asked questions, but we solicited information as to you know, what they thought their concerns were specific to their buildings. Uh, we uh, have made some interior and exterior observations of, of all your facilities. Uh, we've requested some documents, uh, primarily the emergency management plan for the facilities and then any documents that were specific to uh, intruder issues, uh, how your maybe intruder drills are being conducted, uh, classroom procedures along those lines. So those, those have been provided to us and we're in the process of reviewing those now. Uh, we did a random audit of three to four classrooms at each site. Um, we, uh, 
then in conjunction with the audits of the classrooms, we then interviewed the teachers of those specific classrooms. And again, we used a little questionnaire. The questionnaire uh, results will be contained in the final report. Uh, and then we also gave the teachers an opportunity to give us input as to specific to the classroom, uh, you know, what, uh, what their concerns might be. Um, we also um, looked at access control measures across the district. both uh, from the internal perspective of individual classrooms and office areas, as well as you know, uh, exterior doors that lead, in, that lead into facilities. Emergency response plans, uh, as Dr. Lucy said, we met with the district safety committee last week, uh, and then we had kind of an exit interview with the district administrative team uh, last week as well. And then we're back today to do, of course, the in-service uh, and then do our presentation tonight with you. Uh, I wanted to highlight some strengths. I've already talked a little bit about these in some earlier comments, uh, especially that first one dealing with the Standing Safety Committee. We just view that as a, a, a real uh, strong strength in any school district. Um, we think that whatever changes ultimately you decide to make, whatever recommendations you decide to uh, follow up and implement, uh, will require a broad-based community support. Um, and so you, you're, you're already a step ahead of that when you have those people participating uh, I won't read these other two, but I again I saw um, a number of these in place. I noted at the uh, uh, safety committee meeting, I believe it was the sheriff that mentioned that in the aftermath of Sandy Hook, one of the things that he had uh, done with the, from the sheriff's department's perspective was make sure they had a deputy uh, out at um, Bloomsdale uh, on a fairly regular basis, or at least as often as they could put one out there on the property. Uh, if nothing else, just simply setting on the lot locations being highly visible. I just I want to note that in here uh, as well. And then your district did participate in a live webinar on the issue of active sh uh, shooter lethal assailant procedures that was uh, held about two weeks ago. Um, I don't know, Dr. Lucy had probably, what, eight or nine people that participated in that. Um, uh, the last part of the presentation here, I, I just selected some uh, items that I thought um, uh, would be easy to give you a visual display of, of things that we look for uh, again, our, and our audit is fairly narrowly focused. I mean, it's not a broad-based audit looking at all aspects of school safety. It's looking at, again, at issues of intruders and those type of things. Uh, this is from Bloomsdale. Uh, you have a, 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 what I call a closed courtyard setting out there where there's no uh, entrance onto the grounds from the courtyard without going back into the building. And then you have classrooms on both sides, and some of those classrooms have exterior doors that lead into the courtyard, uh, as well as windows along through there. You know, and while typically we think of, uh, in an emergency, egress is going to be out the classroom door, I can clearly create some situations for you where that would not be possible and where teachers might look for alternate egress methods to quickly evacuate the kids out of the classroom. In this case, they might exit into the courtyard, but the problem here is, is that the door out of that courtyard is kept locked during the school day. And so once in the courtyard, there's no place to go from there. And the door with the orange arrow is uh, located at Interesting enough, and the reason I want to highlight this for you is when you go through that door, you immediately step across the hallway, there's another set of exterior doors to take you out on the ground, through the playground, and the school's emergency relocation um, place is actually then that direction from those doors on across the playground area. So, uh, you know, one of the recommendations that you will see from us will be that that door during the school day is kept unlocked. Uh, you know, in the, uh, while unlikely event and remote chance, but it could happen where they might have to exit and you'll note, and when you see our final report, uh, there will be a number of things that we will suggest to you that will have really no cost associated, which you know uh, uh, should bring a smile to your face uh, when I say no cost. But there will be some things that will have no cost, and this is simply a procedural type thing here that uh, could potentially pay big dividends. Uh, then on our next one, and I will, what I'm about to describe to you is fairly typical in school settings, so you're not unique by any means. Um, one of the things we noted is that you've gone to some expense over the years in putting some pretty good locking systems on these classroom doors. In fact, just about every classroom that we looked at uh, were key entry from both interior and exterior from the door. Uh, good locking systems. Uh, really, you know, uh, nothing negative about the locking systems themselves. The problem is, is that then adjacent to the locking systems are the windows. Uh, and in an intruder event, especially if you have someone with intent of getting in that classroom, if that's really what they want to do, there is a uh, little deterrence and protection there, simply break out the glass. And if you know a Sandy Hook, uh, though the final the reports aren't out officially yet, but it's, 
it's fairly common knowledge that the intruder there simply shot out the glass to get a, to gain entry because the door was locked. Uh, in this case, you'd simply break out the glass, reach through, turn the door handle to down position, the door opens right up on you, even though it is locked. Uh, and they have to be keyed that way for emergency egress, so that doesn't require a key to open it on the inside in case you have to evacuate. Um, you'll see at the bottom we provided you uh, a couple of recommendations. One, a long-term recommendation, rather than compound the problem in the future, as you renovate, do new construction, uh, we would recommend that you install doors that have uh, the door glass insert. And we do, we do know that you need to have glass inserts in these doors. Uh, in fact, your insurance carrier probably requires you to have those glass inserts for viewing purposes. But they need to be located in a place where um, it, is, it is practically, if not impossible, to simply reach through and activate the locking mechanism. In the short term, and this is off of your, uh, several of your internal safety committees at the school levels, we noticed on their recommendations, or actually their suggestions, and they were concerned about this as well, uh, they wanted some type of slide bar locking system that would be a secondary lock out of reach of the glass area. And we would concur with that uh, with the caveat that you would need to clear that through your local fire officials uh, related to uh, building, related to uh, fire codes and all that. Uh, there are some codes out there that spell out the kind of locking systems and how they can be installed and, and so forth. So you'd want to clear that through them. But I, I don't think that'll be a problem on that. And then the last one uh, uh, for your review tonight is on the window issue. Uh, we are big proponents of every ground level classroom having a secondary egress method. Uh, again, I can describe to you a, no, no, a, a number of scenarios, and not all of them related to the uh, uh, army intruder issue. I mean, you could have a fire issue where uh, exiting out the classroom door into the hallway would not be a possibility. So it's not just about army intruder issues here. Uh, the window on the left is one of your windows in your school district. I will tell you that you had a number of windows that we looked at that did allow egress, though it wasn't the easiest to do or the most convenient, but they would allow egress in a pinch. Uh, this particular window was far more difficult uh, to have an emergency egress out of because you've got a metal support bar in the middle. And while it's hard to tell how far that window opens, trust me, uh, I, I'm fairly small build. I would have some difficulty getting out that window. I think if somebody was behind me shooting, I, I probably could squeeze through there. Uh, but that'd be about the only reason I could squeeze through there. Um, small kids, uh, small kids probably could go through there. But it, again, it would be a slow process. I show you a picture on the right. This is out of another district here in Missouri that when they built their elementary school, they had their window specs so that every classroom had, had one window. Now, they had multiple windows in a classroom, but one window was hinged on the side and created uh, literally emergency exit out the window. Uh, and so from the exterior, the windows all looked the same. From the interior, there was one window that was always hinged. Um, and they had to build a spec specifically for that reason. Uh, now when you get into multi-level facilities, uh, it becomes a little more dicey on how you're going to do an emergency egress. And you know, and sometimes we'll have classrooms where you just simply can't do it. Um, but our recommendation would be is where you can Uh, I think uh, there are a couple of slides as just general recommendations. Some of these I've already talked about. I'll uh, just kind of let you browse through those. Um, you know, the bottom one, the very last one on there is, again, probably one of those almost no-cost items. Um, you know, as a visitor to your campus, I had a building map. And I will tell you that as I walked around, particularly this complex, and looking at the map, I mean, I sort of knew about where I was, but I had no idea where I was in relation to a particular room in the side of the building because it would just be rows of windows. Uh, and so you think of your emergency service providers that respond here to some catastrophic event and are needing to know or locate where a particular classroom is, and they've got the same building plan I'm looking at, not knowing what window on, what, on the building goes to what classroom. So one of the best practice strategies that we now recommend is that the, the, the one window in every classroom on the exterior side now has a matching room number that matches up with what's on the door of that classroom that corresponds to the building map. And your emergency service providers have those maps, so they know if they're if there's uh, something in a classroom that they need to immediately access because of an injury or whatever, and you know they can look at the window and, and it's the number 13, and they can correspond that to the building map and know where they're at. And it doesn't have to be a large, uh, gaudy type place. But I mean, your law enforcement people are going to have <coughs> viewing devices because they're going to be a distance away anyways. Uh, but those windows do need to be marked. There. So again, a fairly almost a no cost item on that. And then this will be the last slide. Um, 
I guess what I would draw your attention to is our last one. This morning, um, we did two breakout sessions with uh, teacher groups, and we uh, purposely took them through a tabletop exercise, which is fairly unique in a school setting. I mean, uh, it's not something that a lot of school people are familiar with, uh, use of tabletop exercises, but it's it's the what I would call the premier way and the best way of training school staff. As in fact, the U.S. Department of Education has been recommending now for about seven years. This is what they really recommend on training frontline staff. We took your took two uh, two groups of people through that this morning. Uh, I can tell you once again, I, it, it didn't surprise me. Uh, they were uh, they enjoyed it. They actively participated, and without exception, I think every one of them would tell you tonight they're here. They learned something out of that exercise. So that that is a pretty standard recommendation we we provide districts is the use of uh, tabletop exercises. We actually provided your district with a complete set of tabletop exercise books. Again, another no cost item. Uh, those can be worked into faculty meetings or other type of staff development um, uh, situations uh, where you can use them. So, uh, with that in mind, um, I'll take some questions. If you have questions, come ahead. sessions this morning as well. I don't know if you refer to the breakout session or in the general session. Uh, but there was an inquiry from staff uh, uh, really wanting to know not only what we thought about that, but, but for some reasoning about why it was either not necessarily a good idea or, or a good idea. And um, and then, you know, I have a law enforcement background, so I, you know, it's one I have kind of struggled with a little bit. Um, you know, because the argument that uh, the only thing that's really going to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun uh, really holds some water. I mean, there is some legitimacy to that to that argument. I guess where we would come down at is we want the good guy holding the gun to be the law enforcement personnel. And so where we put our emphasis at uh, in our recommendations is trying to create um, uh, ways to impede, uh, distract, deter, uh, and slow down intruders allow enough time for law enforcement to uh, arrive on the scene and take action. Because um, most of these events play out literally anywhere from four to five to six, seven minutes um, at most. Uh, there are some really good arguments for not arming staff. Um, the amount of stress that staff are going to experience uh, in an active shooter situation is going to be literally off the chart. Um, the amount of preparation that, that would probably be involved in arming staff, uh, in, my, in my estimation, would not even come close to preparing staff for what they're going to experience in a hallway setting. Uh, you also run the risk of, on any given day, staff members that may be armed may have student supervision, so then they are put into a position of making a decision, do I leave my kids unattended to go into the hallway to confront the armed intruder, uh, which I think is problematic. Uh, it's not feasible to arm all staff um, so who do you decide to arm and then what do you do on the days when those staff members are sick and not available? Do you have substitute people that are armed only on those days? Um, and you know, your buildings are so large that then you have to get into strategically where do you place people that are armed and so, it does, it, you know, it, it, you get past the point of who's qualified, it's more like where are they at in the building so they can most quickly intervene. There's just so many different issues out there. Um, we just don't see it being being practical uh, for a lot of different reasons. Now, you know, again, uh, we don't disagree that the good guy with the gun is probably going to stop the bad guy with the gun. Uh, we would rather spend our time doing some of the things we talked with you about tonight, uh, you know, working on how to better secure your facilities so that uh, and get a better alert system in place so that maybe you buy some time um, and shrink down that amount of time when you, um, for law enforcement. So that's, that's even more importantly for them, our people, can you tell us, George? Well, uh, our school insurance carrier, Music, um, that liability insurance carrier, won't carry us. We will have no liability insurance. Um, 
the one school district in the state that has so far looked at trying to write a policy uh, that would allow for that uh, went out shopping for insurance and was told they have yet, to my knowledge, not been able to find a carrier. Um, so I can't, in good conscience, recommend something that is going to leave us without liability insurance. Um, the only, you know, the only thing, only way our insurance carrier will cover someone with a gun on campus is if that person is a law enforcement official in the uh, carrying out of their duties or a trained certified security guard. So, you know, those are, those are our only two options uh, that would continue to allow us to have insurance coverage. So, um, you know, while there are possibilities and we have, you know, we have more conversations to be held uh, regarding the possibility of a SRO, uh, the possibility of security personnel on campus and, you know, those conversations still need to happen and, and once we get all of our recommendations in, we'll look at all of that. Uh, but I, having a gun, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, a gun that someone can access kept locked up and only certain people can access it at a certain time, you still lost your liability coverage when that person takes hold of that gun, unless they happen to be a law enforcement official. So uh, insurance companies play the averages, people. They're about the bottom line and they're about the dollar. If they thought it was safer for us to have a gun and less likelihood of a, a violent act if we brought guns into school, then they would by all means urge us to do so. That is just not the case. The idea that a, an attack is, is imminent is heightened for us right now because of what happened. It happens every time we hear something of that nature, but the likelihood is so very, very small, and the number of schools where this has happened are so very, very few in comparison to the total number of schools that that your, your chances go way, way, way down of that, that violent event, but bringing more guns in creates a heightened chance for other things to occur, such as an administrator being overwhelmed or, or even a law enforcement official having their gun taken by you know, a kid or a group of kids or whatever, and, and using that uh, to, to the detriment of the, the whole. So, um, these are these are facts. These are where we are with our with the bottom line on some of those things. So, while there are still more conversations to be had about who perhaps you know the good guy with the gun is and and when they're here on campus and that kind of thing, uh, I think we have to move past the idea that we're going to bring guns in for our school personnel to carry or to keep on on site here to uh, access at a time when we. They would have got forbid an armed intruder. So um, I, I believe that we kind of put that so that there are some things that are, are feasible and uh, that, that will enhance our safety. Now, Sheriff Stoltzer wanted me to make sure and say, and because I respect and admire Gary, I'm going to say <laughs> that, uh, you know, the things that we're talking about doing here will inc increase our safety on a regular day to day basis. Will they stop an armed intruder? No. I get that. I understand that, but there are prohibitions to what we can do because I can't also recommend that we don't have liability insurance. <laughs> so, you know, we're it's a rock and a hard place kind of decision, and we have to do all the things that are prudent and reasonable to keep our children safe. But I don't want them to feel like they're coming to an armed camp or a prison facility when they come to school. I think there's a balance that we need to reach. We need to all determine what that is. But you did say that. An SRO, somebody supplied by like either the St. Genevieve Police Department or the Sheriff's Department, would not would be all right with using. Yes, there they do say that that, uh, and our, our policy actually states that uh, someone with uh, that is a law enforcement official may carry a gun on campus or a certified trained security guard. So as we talk, as you say, further down the road, that, those are that things that SRO can remain thing. on the table. <coughs> Obviously, that's a cost factor, and we'll have to look at all of those. How many schools would you say there are in the United States that could use that figure? Uh, about 100 and 
hundred forty, four hundred forty-five thousand. Okay. Actual buildings. So. Yeah, and you know that's. Um, it, it depends on what, how you want to define school. If you start counting private schools, religious-based schools, Montessori's, day, I mean daycare. I mean, if you if you expand it on out, it it, it really gets to be be pretty tremendous. And you know, again. Uh, it, if you start talking about arming staff and some of the other things that are being talked about, I mean, just the, the concept of putting, uh, I mean, there was, I know there was a national um, debate going on about putting an armed officer in every school in this country, but again, where do you draw the line? Does that also extend then into daycare centers and every place where there are groups of children that congregate during the day? I mean, it, it gets to be really unmanageable um, on that. Um, so yeah, about 144, 45. everyone knows that we will be making these decisions, but some of the decisions won't be told to the public because it's confidential and they don't know what's, what our decisions are. But you can be ensured that your children will be um, taken care of and very carefully um, watched. Thank you. took uh, this year's calendar and put in next year's dates to a comparable format and so uh, up for discussion uh, we will uh, get some uh, get a, a method of posting responses uh, online I've talked to our SGNEA uh, multiple times about this process and and we have the calendar committee I think almost all members in place. That committee will consist of uh, a, a representative from each building, one from uh, SGNEA, one from the uh, ESP group, one from MSTA, and one from our administrators. And so uh, once all those comments come in, uh, we will um, sit down and go over them and try to hash out what would be the committee's recommendation to you all. Uh, as you're well aware, though, you get to make the final decision about <laughs> whatever it, it turns out to be. So uh, hopefully by next month's meeting, our calendar committee will have a recommendation for you. But folks, uh, the, uh, the calendar will be posted and uh, open for comment starting uh, hopefully tomorrow. We're, that's, our, that's our goal. And so we'll, uh, we'll wait to hear what everyone has to say and suggestions. One thing I did want to mention, and Jeff Nix has already put this out to our staff, but um, the blackout period for activities currently, I, I just listed the corresponding dates. Uh, he's told me that I was incorrect, so here are the correct blackout period dates. Saturday, August 3rd to Sunday, August 11th. So that's a, that's a minor change there. And certainly that's still open for discussion. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to, you know, lobby for some other days there. So uh, that is the period of time when um, Misha tries to help us give um, families a chance to get away and uh, be able to have some family vacation time. I, I do think that uh, we may have some issue here with, uh, if I'm not mistaken, our registration falls into the dead period time. So. Um, we have worked with families to go who want to go and register at another time. That that really is a very easily uh, managed hurdle. So if that turns out to be the time that we do our dead period, but uh, uh, it is allowable to do a different week for activities as opposed to athletics. But what happens then is that you have in a family one football kid and one band kid, and that means you can never go anywhere. Um, <laughs> Trust me, I've lived that particular. <laughs> so our idea is to try to put those on the same week so that we do indeed allow families to get away if they want to do that. Okay. Next is C6. Yes, Dr. Lindsay has the uh, C6 presentation. Uh, before we really get into the presentation, I want to talk a little bit about the, the process and thank everyone that was involved in Really, we had a lot of parent involvement. We had uh, community members, business owners that were in 
Ball, uh, Mr. Crowley, Mr. Bubba uh, were there, teachers, administrators, uh, really a large group of people that, that uh, uh, took the, the comprehensive school improvement plan uh, that we're required to, uh, to have in place and uh, tore it apart, evaluated it, uh, made some changes. Uh, I'll tell you that most of the changes uh, uh, have to do with new APR, SIP 5 uh, that is coming up. So most of my my presentation of the CSIP is actually going to focus on MSIP, uh, which is the Missouri School Improvement Program and the changes that, that are in place because of that. Um, so I think if we can turn this uh, That is unchanged. 